Thank you. Uh, I have the pleasure of uh, presenting this uh, a case study of sorts using applied improvisation. Um, if you are familiar, any of you, uh, with doing the work we call DNI, diversity and inclusion, uh, that's what this talk is going to speak to. The work that I've been doing in it in the last two years. I'm going to jump right into it. So, if you are not particularly familiar uh, with the terms DNI, I wanted to kind of put something to kind of uh, just kind of get a definition of sorts so that we could be familiar with it. And diversity and inclusion work is mainly around the space of sensitivity. Uh, using uh, different businesses, whether it be nonprofit or for profit, it's sort of making your workplace uh, sort of diverse and equitable. Uh, now, we talk about that in many different ways. We could talk about as far as gender, race, culture, faiths, or sexual orientation. But there are many other ways too, as well. Now, that's, of course, the tip of the iceberg. We often say that just saying that definition is not enough. We often say, uh, in the space of DNI, that it's we're often going in and working with uh, individuals, and and often when I'm working with them, it's just a tip of the iceberg, and what I'm trying to do is just really open themselves up to sort of this dialogue and this conversation around what that means. And so what I find is uh, this uh, this quote sort of from uh, uh, a really great quote that highlights that it's great to seek out diverse candidates and include them in the company culture, but what happens next, right? How does one go further in creating an actual space that truly embraces differences? So I find that applied improvisation works wonderfully for that because what it does is it speaks to this term, intersectionality. That's an easier word to write than say. Uh, and so intersectionality, now what does that mean? Uh, that is actually this sort of field that's uh, been really popularized in the last uh, kind of uh, it last five to ten years of what separates or makes me unique. Uh, I could relate to some of those things that may also to someone been right in my uh, workplace, uh, a fellow coworker or a manager. Uh, I could relate to maybe uh, what makes them different or uh, the same. So sort of these differences. In other words, my religion uh, of being maybe the only Jewish person at a mostly Christian workplace. Uh, I could sort of relate to that feeling uh, to someone is that on the other spectrum, someone who is maybe gay or lesbian or transgender, uh, and they're the only one in a maybe heterosexual mostly uh, workplace. So we could find some similarities in there, and that's, that's where I find that applied improvisation sort of could speak to. Now, how do we do that? Uh, and I think it relies completely on making space for the different folks, emotions, and, and using empathy to do this. So diversity and inclusion means allowing employees to actually bring their whole selves into, uh, into the space and uh, kind of bring it to the table. So it's hard to do that, though. It's easy to say, but it's hard to do that in the workplace. These are actually uh, businesses. And I do most of this work uh, in banks. Uh, some of the top banks in the United States, uh, the United States I've been working with for the last uh, two years. And there's reasons why. A lot of those uh, businesses are actually regulated and mandated to do this work. Well, that even makes it, you might say, well, great, right? That actually puts a challenge because people are, in a way, forced to go through this training. Let me explain how I uh, kind of manage this. So I'm lucky enough to be working at this wonderful place called Coca Biz. Uh, Coca Biz is actually a part of this uh, nonprofit arts center based in St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, uh, Coca, uh, the first uh, four letters, uh, Coca Biz gets its name from Coca, which is actually the uh, third largest uh, fully arts integrated complex uh, in the United States. So it's multi, it's opera, it's dance, it's uh, fine arts, it's uh, theater, it's all those things under one roof. And uh, Coca has been around for a little over 30 years, uh, and Coca Biz has only been around 10 years. And what the mission of that, uh, the, the kind of the problem that we're solving is using arts uh, to actually go into corporations and businesses and use the artist, the dancer, the storyteller, the musician to kind of touch on these topics. What can we do with the art? And so myself using improvisation was a perfect match. And so we created about two years ago this program called Acting with Awareness that was specifically addressing this idea of diversity, uh, and, and sensitivity training 
uh, mostly, again, in think of these big banks, you know, these big corporate banks. Uh, what we found was that uh, this is something that was radically different. When we actually went into spaces, uh, and, and that photo is one of my colleagues, Kathy Bentley, who is a playwright and a director, uh, what we found is that we were giving them different tool sets. They were used to, to kind of like just really going through workbooks and manuals and PowerPoints. But what we were doing is we were actually playing those theater games, theater games and then unpacking them. So one of the processes of where we start this, where it's anchored, uh, is in this really uh, prime, the, kind of the first game that we play. And it really anchors the whole day. Um, it's, it, it's based on a game uh, that is used often in many uh, th uh, theater classrooms, uh, which is sometimes called I Like Cake or Truth Chairs, where everyone sits in a circle uh, and there's only enough, circle, enough chairs except for one person in the center, and the center person has to say something true about themselves. And if it's true for anyone in the circle, they all have to move, and it, it sort of creates this uh, one person's gonna end up always in the center. Well, we've morphed that into a different version of that, where it's called Where I'm From. And the first level, we play it, and this game is played for about 45 minutes to almost maybe quite an hour. The first level is just geographical. So people stand in that center, and they have to say the phrase, where I'm from, there were mountains. Or they might say, where I'm from, the streets never were quiet, right? And then the, whatever's true, people move, right? The next wave, we go into where I'm from, a cultural truth. So where I'm from, women always stayed home and raised the family, right? Or where I'm from, uh, you didn't see uh, two uh, same-sex couples holding hands, right? And then the last way is personal. That's the last process where they will start to get up after about 30, 40 minutes and start to kind of say, where I'm from, um, my dad didn't see me pretty much until I was about 17, right? Something real personal. So this goes on for a while. And uh, you can see this is sort of an example of a, a, a really literally a bunch of executives uh, at a multi-level. They could actually be management and actually bank teller, could be a VP, uh, it could be someone that works behind the scenes. And they are all in that circle and they're doing this. Uh, we go from this process directly to creating tableaus. So the groups have to kind of get in pairs and then pairs get into foursomes and then foursomes get into uh, groups of six or eight and they have to pick uh, where I'm from that resonated to them. And after they do that, they build a tableau. And the tableaus are amazing. What we see out of these tableaus are things that these groups have never addressed or never tried. Uh, and, and, and from the tableaus, there's just, there's nothing about it other than watching them, produce them, make them, and then reaction. The conversations, we have a great critiquing format that really gets people to kind of address. They don't get to respond. We critique in a positive way or questionable way. And uh, these are some of the ones that actually came from one of the, a recent one that I did. Uh, where I'm from, our marriage was illegal 20 years ago. Now, the person who said that was saying it because they were in an interracial, was an African-American woman. But when they translated the tableau, a group, they did it to, that's a, those are high-level two VPs from a bank uh, who are heterosexual. Uh, and they actually got to recreate that tableau. Where I'm from, bombs were used to kill black and brown people. This bank is, uh, the headquarters is based in Birmingham, Birmingham Alabama. And so uh, for them, that was a real, and some of the people that are there living actually remember it as a child. Um, and where I'm from, I saw death all around me growing up. Where I'm from, black and brown people were the service workers. And I have one more here. Where I'm from, interracial dating was forbidden. So they get to kind of sort of create these tableaus. And you can see there's laughter in some cases, and there's some cases there's tears. And the whole point and function of this is to kind of move them through this process of, of warming them up and getting them to play the game. And in the process of playing the game, they actually lose all, the, all those things that separate us in the workplace, right? And they're actually able to finally have a conversation. Now, I'm not going to lie, people do have triggered moments. There is sometimes people that will have an argument or a feeling, and that's processed in the last portion. That's why we save a lot of time in 90 minutes to even more than that sometimes. We take a break and come back in a debrief to talk about those things. It's all about starting the process of a conversation. 
So uh, if you're interested in this space, I empower all of you to kind of really think about how you can bring those different co-workers together using that intersectionality and empathy. Thank you.